the 17th of January 1961, Patrice Lumumba, the first Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of Congo, was assassinated. Described as one of the most significant assassinations in modern African history, this heinous crime is widely believed to have been the fruit of two interrelated conspiracies which were led by the US and Belgian governments. To truly appreciate the historical importance of Lumumba's death, it is important to understand three things. One, the global context in which the assassination took place. Two, Lumumba's status as a revolutionary nationalist leader. And three, the long-term impact of his death on Congolese politics. From the late 1800s to the early 1990s, the US and Belgium were arguably two of the most important external forces in the shaping of Congo's destiny. From as early as seven months before the infamous Berlin Conference of 1884, in which European powers gathered to divide and allocate the various African regions to themselves, the US was the first world power to formally recognize the ownership claims made by Belgium's King Leopold II to the territories of the Congo Basin. In 1885, King Leopold established what was then known as the Congo Free State, which he would rule in his own personal capacity, completely separate from his role as the constitutional head of the Belgian government. King Leopold and his men would go on to brutally exploit the people of the so-called Congo Free State and commit all kinds of atrocities in their bid to profit from the region's natural resources. Putting in place a system of forced labor all across the territory, King Leopold would unleash a reign of terror in which rape, mutilations, and mass killings became the order of the day. Although scholars disagree on the exact figures, the most commonly cited death tolls range from between 5 to 10 million deaths during the 21 years that the Congo Free State was ruled by King Leopold. By way of comparison, the total death toll of the Nazi Holocaust was between 6 to 11 million, but for various reasons, the atrocities of King Leopold and the Congo Free State are nowhere near as well known. Reacting to the public outcry following the revelations of King Leopold's atrocities in Congo, the US joined other world powers in calling for the Belgian government to seize control of the Congo Free State and turn it into a Belgian colony. Belgium eventually took colonial control of Congo in 1908 and would rule the country until its independence in 1960. During the colonial period, the US acquired a very significant stake in the vast natural wealth of the Congo and is believed to have used uranium sourced from Congolese mines to manufacture the atomic bombs that were dropped in the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. With the outbreak of the Cold War shortly after World War II, which saw the US and its allies square up to the fast-growing Soviet Union and its anti-capitalist agenda, the Western powers could not afford to allow the Soviet Union to gain access to strategic raw materials such as those found in the Congo and other African countries. From a US perspective, there could not have been a more risky time for African nations to gain independence than the late 1950s and 60s. With the Cold War in full swing and the host of African leaders expressing their approval for Soviet-style economics, the US government needed to act fast and decisively in order to protect its global interests. And it is for this very reason that Patrice Lumumba's push in the late 1950s for Congo to gain genuine independence and sovereign control of its resources placed him in direct opposition to Western interests. Shortly after his election as the first Prime Minister of the newly independent Congo, he was faced with an army revolt and cessationist rebel groups from Congo's mineral-rich provinces began to wreak havoc on the country. Belgium sent in troops supposedly to protect Belgian nationals living in the Congo, but it was widely believed that the Belgian troops were actually working to strengthen the rebels. Lumumba appealed to the United Nations to expel the Belgians and deploy UN peacekeeping troops to help repress the rebels. But with the United Nations unwilling to act quickly to help suppress the rebels, Lumumba appealed to the Soviet Union for military equipment to assist his troops in their fight to restore internal order. This move would set the Western powers into panic mode, and the CIA, MI6, and Belgian security operatives would all allegedly begin plotting to bring an end to his premiership. In their bid to get rid of him and all that he stood for, the American and Belgian governments are believed to have conspired to deploy all the tools and resources at their disposal, including the United Nations Secretariat under Dag Hammarskjöld and Ralph Bunch to buy the support of Lumumba's Congolese rivals. Within just under seven months after the country gained independence from Belgium and his appointment as the country's first prime minister, Patrice Lumumba was seized and executed by Belgian and Congolese operatives of the newly installed military government led by the infamous Mobutu Sese Seko, a government whose entry into power is believed to have been backed by the US and Belgian governments acting in collaboration with key UN officials. The execution was swift but brutal. Lumumba, along with two of his associates, 
Maurice Umpolo and Joseph Okito were lined up against a tree and shot one at a time. The execution is believed to have taken place on the 17th of January 1961 at around 9.40 p.m. The full details of how the bodies were disposed of are simply too shocking to be described in this video. With Lumumba eliminated, the Mobutu regime would go on to pay nothing more than lip service to the ideals of national unity, economic independence and pan-African solidarity which had been championed by Lumumba, shattering the hopes and aspirations of the millions of Congolese who had placed their faith in the great leader. The assassination was against a backdrop of great political turmoil as the country was greatly divided with four separate governments all laying claim to legitimate control of the territory. The first was a central government in Kinshasa, which was then called Leopoldville. The second was a rival central government led by Lumumba's followers in Kisangani, formerly known as Stanleyville, while the third and fourth were led by secessionist leaders hailing from the mineral-rich provinces of Katanga and South Kasai. As the physical elimination of Lumumba had removed what Western powers saw as the major threat to their interests in the Congo, they subsequently directed their energies towards restoring and growing the authority of the pro-Western regime in Kinshasa over the entire country, and effectively snuffed out the Lumumba-inspired rival Kisangani government in August 1961. The other two rival governments would also subsequently be snuffed out. The South Kasai regime was disbanded in 1962, while the Katanga secessionist group was suppressed in January 1963. With the unrivaled support of his Western allies, the Mobutu regime would go on to rule Congo with an iron fist for over three decades, unleashing an almost unrivaled reign of corruption, terror and financial mismanagement that would plague the country for years to come. Due to his relatively short political career, the full impact of Lumumba's legacy could be rather hard to fully quantify. His death in 1961 was seen as a huge blow to African nationalist movements at the time, but it ultimately fanned the fire amongst other African revolutionaries to continue in their fight against imperialism. Numerous historians have also cited his death as a major contributing factor to the radicalization of the American civil rights movement in the 1960s. And even till today, Patrice Lumumba continues to be revered as a symbolic representation of the Pan-African struggle for liberation and his ideas have been canonized in a political ideology known as Lumumbism, a complex doctrine which can be best described as a combination of nationalism, Pan-Africanism and social progressivism. His life may have been brutally cut short but his spirit certainly lives on. Once again it's KB Tyro for New Africa. Please like, share and subscribe and until next time.